So um, I think the best thing I can do really by way of responding is, is by, by, by hoping to facilitate some conversation between the, between the speakers here and, and with the audience as well. Um, I've, just been, I've just been hearing these, these wonderful presentations for the first time as well. So I'm, I'm just um, thought while you prepare your questions, which I'm sure you have many, I would just begin to put a couple of thoughts I've been formulating as I've been listening for over the last um, hour and a half to these really great talks, um, which if they weren't coordinated, which I'm sure they, they weren't, or <laughs> um, really resonated wonderfully together. Um, I was, I was thinking as, as Philippa was talking about her experiment in, in, um, in living, living exhibition, unseen exhibitions in this final startling moment of having this experience of deja vu but, um, before an experience she was registering as having missed and suddenly realizing she actually had seen it. Um, how, how, how blurry the, sometimes the distinction be, can become between seeing an exhibition and not seeing an exhibition and how, in a sense, this, this feeling of, of desire and nostalgia for an exhibition you feel you've missed can so often happen in the middle of an exhibition itself and it seems to be, seems to be you know, kind of keyed into the experience of an exhibition starting with, starting with the anticipation of it and and the encountering it and the wall texts and the experience you know, within every museum of not, you know, of just being riveted magnetically towards like this too much information on the wall that somehow one makes a beeline for between, you know, before seeing and never knowing when exactly you can tear yourself away from that text and actually start looking. Um, and I think it's an anxiety that we're, we're kind of groomed um, into, into experiencing every time we walk into a museum. It's very hard to, to know exactly how much time to, to give a work. Um, um, and it seems to connect it also to the experience of, you know, the desire for, to, to not leave an exhibition without, without that catalog or without, without something to bring home with you of that. Um, and so I, I was, you know, wherever that, wherever that, that, that gap between the, the so-called experience of the, of the thing or the, of the exhibition and the, and the um, retroactive documentary reconstruction or reliving of that experience. I mean, that can happen and I think does happen in every moment within every experience of every artwork. And it's something which I think both of, both of these artists have, have shown in, in, in some really fundamental ways. And I was thinking, you know, particularly, um, it's particularly apt that they're sitting here on the stage together, um, having worked so closely in a kind of archival way with, you know, found in some sense, found or discovered or given or um, bequeathed or um, dictated material that was, that was their task or their, their discovery and doing something with it, which is not reenactment exactly, not reproduction, not replication, not, not nostalgic revisiting, um, but, 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 a, but a, a re, a, so, some form of repetition um, which raises the question not just about the past, the relationship between a present and, and a past work or event, um, which cannot strictly re-exist, you know, in any sense in the present, but in the repetition itself is, 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 is doing something to that present. Um, and, and, and the experience within the, within the present work of a certain repetition itself. So um, that is to say the gap between the, the gap or the interval, or what you're referring to as the minimal difference, um, between the, a, a pr the present work and the, the, the images which are being indexed in that work is also a gap which inhabits the present of the work itself. And um, this, this appeared very very vividly in your work when one, one actually couldn't have a present, a, a simultaneous experience of any specific image in your work. So the gap was not simply, um, or the, 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 the tension being navigated wasn't simply between your image and the images which were being 
not recirculated or not exactly reanimated, but being being re, or being retrieved, but being revisited in some sense. The gap also inhabited, you know, every image or every every still, which was not exactly a still um, in your work. And I was, I was, um, and, and likewise in 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 your. Um, uh, recycling but repetition itself you know the sort of the movement of images within your work seems to me spoke really resonated in a in a really interesting way with what what Leslie was doing so I was going to I really thought I would start off by just inviting the the three of you to to respond what to what each of you were were saying, I mean, I have, I have a further question pertaining, I guess, more specifically to the two of you, which was really how striking how um, how this moment of abstraction and uh, abstraction in art, you know, so, so suddenly emerge in the middle of these very figurative moments. In your case, the the you know at the very end, these 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 holes themselves became became minimalist shapes mm -hmm. that be, you know form this kind of ballet on on the screen. Um, and in your case, um, in so many ways, but I was really struck by the, the way in which these flat surface sculptures, um, in which space itself started to fold over and what would seem to be a, a blank page almost became a, uh, you know, what seemed to be a, a, a screen or a page became a physical object as the, as a kind of, not simply, not simply an, an image or a photograph becoming sculptural, but even the, the support of a photograph becoming a kind of, a, a larger than life sculpture. So these are some of the, you know, very random thoughts that I've been having mm -hmm. as I've been listening to you all in, in the dark. So I thought maybe we could just take a few minutes while the while the yeah. audience collects their thoughts to to invite a kind of conversation. I now. mean, for the last work there, the innocence, the the uh, image stream that happens that I'm referring to, or the image, the physicalization of the image stream that exists there at the beginning. It's sort of like a material Tumblr page uh, that exists, and the connections between those images are both, um, well, they're, they're multiple things, but they're geopolitical connections that are happening, they're formal connections that are happening. Um, and as it progressed over time, so I made that in 2014, things slip my memory in the image stream. And so the idea of abstraction comes in in watching it. So for many of you watching it, you might make some of the connections between some of those images. You might not. There might be a kind of a formal connection that happens. And I kept on thinking back, and I think this might be something that, that relates back or might have significance to you, something that Martha Rosler would say that is this time passes, specificity wanes, and projections able to do its thing. And so that there's this thing, I think, with going into an archive, looking at an archive, looking at a history um, from another perspective, from 1977. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, and so from that generational thing, but looking, <laughs> but looking, like looking back at something as um, both as a kind of like not having access to the exhibitions, but um, but having this kind of access to it, uh, like a, an un, as Susan Sontag would t say, an unearned relationship with time, or an unearned relationship with the event. We access it through online sources, we access it in a different way, but we don't have, and so there's an ethical paradigm in there, we don't have an earned relationship with these events. But their passing is also something that we have to project. There's an abstraction that's implicit within it. And those works then change over time. Like yours will change in 20 years from a, a different historical moment. Mine will change probably in 10 minutes, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, want, I would like to comment, even though I think the video that you just showed, it's still resonating mm -hmm. with me, so I don't fully have everything that I want to say. But what was striking um, was how you utilized obstructions um, and I, I guess I want to categorize it as revealing the image and then the jump cut to the moving image For sure. mm -hmm. within one work and then an archival moving image. Mm -hmm. um, I found that juxtaposition very rich and um, disturbing aesthetically, yes. <laughs> which I think was an really strong parallel to moving between what the, in it, what the internet or Google algorithm does is it flattens things that 
once you start to extract them, like the, the image of desire or I don't, I wouldn't say all of those were pornographic images, mm -hmm. but like the image, the, the erotic image, yes, I see, sure. yes. and then the image of disaster or destruction or death, like those two things existing on the same plane is horrifying. For sure. And so there's something that, that horror is revisited in a very slow, kind of continuous, mm -hmm. but also tantalizing. I know that sounds strange, but I really, I thought that um, what we do passively on a daily basis like scrolling or what's in our swiping. periphery, yeah. swiping, <laughs> you know, that all of these things are um, coming into our subconscious. For sure. And, and there's so something and, really strong. And so I are other people, right? Yeah. So, like, so like the contact that you have with an archive that you and Bradford had with an archive um, is about the kind of the cropping and the choice, the choice, the editorial choice of a whole system of kind of photographic processes from the photographer to the photo editor to the printer. And then online, we have that in a very kind of immediate way. It is this unearned access, this immediate access. We have an unearned access to another's ethical choices. And those ethical choices then become um, the source for our desire, the source for mm. our, you know. And so there's this interesting kind of like residue that then comes from mm. those things. And a, and yes. a rupture, right? And no, it's uneasy. that's completely, yeah. I mean, even though it feels um, the temporality, I mean, I think it's so fitting. I'm really happy to have the opportunity <laughs> to okay. be in context with you here um, because, I mean, there's something that I don't talk about so much because I, Sometimes I feel like I'd be overbearing in our relation, our phantom bread <laughs> <laughs> relationship to the archive was that um, the identities of the original photographers versus our identity, not only in terms of age, but also race um, and gender, I would like to say. Um, so most of the photographers are men and white men. Um, and I only, I hesitate to bring it up because I feel like it close, It can close mm -hmm. down um, really quickly, but I'm bringing it up in the context of what you were talking about in terms of the editorial, um, the subjectivity that isn't always present in the original, or in my instance, and in the original mm -hmm. archive, like the discussion around those images never kind of goes into that terrain. And what was fascinating to us as we were working through this archive is the invisible, architecture of segregation and all of these kind of cultural norms yeah. that n are not encoded in the image, but they're, they are implicit. Yes. And so yeah. there's something that our resistance to repeat, just simply repeat, felt um, inauthentic, but also uh, it was deserving of um, a more distant yes. positioning. Yeah. I mean, it's just the the <coughs> the Wiseman um, the Wiseman reenactment video that I showed first. I mean, it's a it's a difficult um, work. I had I had more to say about that, but I was running out of time. No one to show that. Uh, anyways, but the um, I usually don't like to show that clip in excerpt, mostly because it was the most fraught clip in the process. The video is about 29 minutes long. Uh, I, it's the first 10 years of Wiseman's filmmaking practice condensed to all of the scenes that I had a guttural reaction mm. to, and then restaged by blocking out the body. Again, this blocking. But that one scene is a scene from Law and Order where um, a young sex worker is... Um, is cornered in a room and choked by um, four white police officers, and she is black. And I had a really difficult time knowing that my disgust and discomfort with the scene, um, I had to really work as Annie was talking about with, with her dancers early, earlier, or, um, the dancers she was working with, not her dancers, the dancers she was working with, um, that there, and her reading to them, there was this really important exchange of an ethical exchange that had to happen between Lorraine Hewitt, who plays um, the figure in, in my reenactment, um, and 
And it was this kind of like this probative thing about a discovery. What does this scene mean? Let's break it down. Let's look at it. But what are these other things? What are these other things for us outside in this world now that are attached mm. to this certain scene, mm. right? Uh, what is my position as a white man in, uh, against Wiseman's position as a white man looking at this scene, mm. right? And those type of things, those kind of, um, the, the kind of, uh, it would be unfair not to frame it. It would be unfair to leave it out of the catalog for mm. some way, to face it, to do as Antigone does, mm. to, to, you know, honor, to not to conform to one's desire, uh, mm. even if that, as Wiseman says, is perhaps a biased, mm. right, to face that thing. Mm. Philip, did you want to respond to this, this idea of a, an unearned experience? Um, it's, um, it's interesting um, because when, well, you, 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 someone mentioned that in the introduction. Uh, when we were discussing the presentation of the innocence on Vidro, um, one of the aspects, and again, it struck me again here, that um, I was very interested in, in exploring was the relation that exists between well, if we think about the verb to shoot and shooting as hunting and shooting as a, a violent gesture of killing or of targeting someone and shooting as the gesture of filming, how they both are overlapped and they become one um, throughout, throughout the film and also in this sequence of holes that are very visible and that in which you insert yourself and you establish a punctum. You were talking about the punctum mm -hmm. in your presentation and you clearly dictating one's, at a certain point, one's almost looking for, the, for these holes when the new image appears, mm -hmm. no? Uh, which I remember we were discussing and I conceived as a form of you inserting yourself in these images, not appropriating them, no, mm -hmm. but um, of relating to them and adding something to them that it's an addition of yours, but it's also radically transforming the way that we as viewers observe these images while also reflecting about violence and the, the, the violent as, as, as a gesture that can also be um, expanded towards the violence of depicting something, of representing, of, mm -hmm. of filming. No? And, and which becomes very, very clear in this constant movement between still and moving images that is um, inherent to your, mm -hmm. to the images. And I think, I mean, I think that that's the kind of maybe the autobiography that that Leslie was talking about in Riffs in Real Time, when when you have an image that might be um, a biographic, but not your biography, right. right? It is a different kind of voice, a different form of a voice that is there, but it's that subjective pop or that 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 hole that happens mm -hmm. in another's right or even in your own that revision of your own history going through there what does this where does this thing lead to where does the, how, do, how do I formalize that thing right mm -hmm. is that a form is that that um, that hole a kind of uh, a, an interlocutor for ethics is that a is it a material itself and is can material be built out of that in some way yeah. But it's also a gesture, um, this, to a certain extent, it's also a gesture of power because ultimately it's only the person who made the whole mm -hmm. that detains the knowledge of the whole image. Sort yeah. of know, that knows that. And, and not only the knowledge because there's something missing, but also because the, the entire image is not visible anymore. No? Mm -hmm. So there's also that fact that it becomes something transformed and, and yeah. we cannot access it anymore. It's also this, it was this effect of seriality that was so striking that also kind of connected your two works because, I mean, the, the whole was always, you know, had this kind of shocking, violent aspect, but it also became something one was expecting and yet it was a surprise each time, but, but it became recognizable. It was, one was sort of <laughs> looking for the whole, but not ever finding in the place that one was looking for it. So it was, you know, it became very manifest. And I had a similar experience you know, watching your, your installation, which, you know, at first appeared to be, appeared to be a, a series of slides, mm -hmm. you know, it appeared to be a series of still images, and then, <coughs> you know, it was a little bit of experience of la jute when suddenly one, you know, suddenly the eyes opened and something, something moved within an otherwise series of still images, and, you know, 
suddenly the grass was waving or the wind was, you know, fluttering the blinds and suddenly you, you kind of realized that there was going to be there was going to be movement but you didn't know when and mm. sometimes it didn't seem like it was going to happen um, but it never felt like okay where's the where's where's the movement going to come it always yeah i think you described it in your comments as an epic moment and it really did have that that feeling like something was something was startling mm. even though you were waiting for it um, which we sort of connected the series in a certain way you know and turned it into you know gave gave Give movement itself a kind of um, a kind of repetitive quality. Mm -hmm. I, I just thought, just in the interest of, of time passing here, whether whether the audience wanted to. I'm sure there's lots of questions. Some microphone going around, so you can just make your make yourselves known. Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks for your presentations, um, and almost following that point, um, I've been thinking about. Uh, both still and moving photographic images alongside an essay uh, that Jacques Derrida wrote uh, titled Usia and Gramet where he uh, sort of considers the relationship between the point and the line um, and states that the point is accidental, uh, never becomes present or exists as presence uh, and almost operates as sort of a byproduct of the, the line and act. Uh, and of course, he's he's thinking in terms of the graphic trace. But um, if we relate the still image to the point along that line and act, where it's sort of bound up uh, in this double movement between memory and anticipation, uh, I think it sort of raises some interesting questions about how we how we experience images between these sort of two modes of consciousness. Uh, and questions that were almost, I guess, implicit in all of your presentations. So following that, um, do you think that memory is perhaps overly privileged in the way that we read images? And is there, I, I'm almost, I've been wondering if there's almost some responsibility uh, to sort of think a little bit more about the anticipatory moment that images gesture to a sort of uh, like remembering forward, uh, I guess, uh, yeah. Hmm. Well, I think for me, it's it it it, um, it kind of goes back to that Rosler quote that I was talking about that 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 um, that as time passes, specificity wanes and projection is able to do its thing. That um, that abstraction is a key in that, right? That that the one way to um, to orchestrate a way out of the kind of binding association of memory to photography is through looking at it as an abstraction in some way. And however that's determined, however, whatever strategies or fundamental filters go into making that image into a, an abstraction in the process or in the kind of after process, the reproduction of something. Um, but that abstraction is a way to do that, to unlock it in some way. Um, so that it's not that privileged site of memory, that it becomes productive in a way, out in its kind of, uh, um, in its residue. I think it's hard for me to answer that question um, in a kind of broad, speculative, like, this is what I feel about photography's relationship to memory. But I will say that my relationship to photography has a, is has is shaped by some aspect of my positioning, my historical positioning in an American context, and often um, erasure being a part of that, or not doc being you know not documented aspects of your presence um, eliminated and intentionally so. So I think like my relationship to um, historic imagery is also about what almost always thinking about it as a, uh, a surface that needs to be um, broken in a way, or um, already assuming that it has a limited, it, has, it, it only has a fraction of the narrative. And then in a Toni Morrison sense, that fiction right, could be this amazing location where you could find um, perhaps something closer to what it is that you were looking for, searching for, in what is perceivably that memory image, or um, which the photograph, we, we make that association. Um, or that even in that space of fiction, perhaps it's also um, not possible to document. 
um, or record. And I'm interested in that. And I think that's how I'm also relating here that there's like this pushing back that, you know, the, that an image has limits. And so then it's pushing back towards the lived moment. And that's to me where there's something very exciting. And if that's a location that I would kind of speculate, that's where it exists for me as an artist and in response to your question. Uh, it's curious that you mentioned um, Derrida, who is someone who's constantly writing about absence in relation to the practice of writing and the mourning of, um, of a presence that is not longer there and to whom you cannot address anymore because you cannot ask questions to the writer of a book or to a text because that is an absence. My because my, one of the points of this exercise and of this, um, my presentation was exactly to comprehend if via writing and writing about artworks and about exhibitions, we could actually go beyond the dichotomy between absence and presence in terms of recollection and in terms of, um, in terms of uh, approaching something that was or not seen, but it was fundamental to shape our cultural memory. You know? So how can we go beyond this uh, dichotomy between the absent and, and, and the presence? And how can memory be a mode to actually install, and we've spoken about projections, you know, to install new presences that are not necessarily standing on this binomial condition? Right, yeah. exactly. Right? Exactly. It's not mm -hmm. just about isolating, because do, do we even believe in presence? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Sorry. Anyway. Yeah. <coughs> Hi. Um, I wanted to thank the panel. It's been really interesting this afternoon. And um, maybe speak to something that Leslie brought up about who gets to be seen. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Susan Mizellis did an amazing talk at the Ryerson Image Center about her Kurdistan project. And it's an archive of people whose history has been destroyed and who are desperately trying to build their own archive. They have no country, they have, you know, they're all in exile, their history's been erased. And it seems to me this discussion of archive also has to include the notion of privilege, of who gets to even have an archive. And I, you know, for some people, visibility is their existence and their history. And I think it's really important to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I? Yes, please. Um, thank you for that comment. That was, um, I, can, I can be more particular now that I'm <laughs> beyond my presentation. My, my sort of discussion, and once again, an unpresential discussion, was actually with, um, going through this volumes of histories of exhibitions by Bruce Alt Schuller and thinking about all those exhibitions that were not there and by not being there were excluded from one canon. It's not the canon, but it's one canon. And thinking about even the very material conditions that allow for certain events and certain projects to exist in time and so others to don't exist in time because they were not photographed, because they were not documented, because the con context of the reception was not that fa favorable for their existence beyond the moment in which they were presented. No? And therefore, um, asking myself how much of the history of art and the history of exhibitions is actually determined by the material conditions, not only for those um, projects, artworks, exhibitions to exist, but also for them to be documented and to be circulated and to be accessed. Uh, and how, how much of that could exist actually beyond the, the, how much the Western canon is actually done on that and how little this is a fundamental element considered by those who are writing these histories. I think we have time for one more question. Oh, could, 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 could you let you? No, you I think that uh, Sarah wanted Leslie to respond oh. to that. Oh, I think no, it was yeah, open. Exactly. I did, to, sorry, I yeah. didn't want no, no, no. <laughs> I, I interpreted it as open to everyone um, to discuss the relationship to privilege in the archive, which we didn't. We did not, I, I know I did not. I think 
Um, but I would add that uh, Walid Rad, the Atlas group, is also extremely influential to me as an artist too, and this to kind of inhabit that space of um, kind of imagining, but then in the guise of uh, 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 the photojournalistic mode or the documentary mode and its relationship to authenticity. So that his his work definitely kind of influences me a great deal, and I think is an amazing model moving forward in general. Yeah. In the research, they staged an exhibition at MACBA, and it's taken on different forms. There's an also a video online with After All where Rosh is talking about the research, but it's really interesting in terms of like the absence of an archive because the work that was in this exhibition that was staged uh, was all destroyed when uh, the PLO uh, administered the exhibition or a division of the PLO, and uh, their offices were bombed, so all the artworks were destroyed. So when Rasha and Christine were going through the research for it, they uh, found that there was not only this exhibition, but they, they found out about this other history of artists that were making work in solidarity with Chile after the coup in 73. And oh, there was this other exhibition and the artist list are kind of similar. And then they kind of tracked this kind of uh, political movement where a lot of people were politicized from first with Vietnam and then with Chile and then got involved with the uh, liberation of Palestine or in solidarity with Palestine. So it was interesting that this absence of artworks related into this really interesting intersectionality in the research that was revealed mm -hmm. uh, just as one particular, like really an exhibition with no artworks because they were destroyed. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think, um, what else could I say to that? <laughs> Other than that, I think, um, no, I appreciate bringing that up because it also, it to me, widens, even though I feel like we are a fraction of um, many generations of artists kind of asking similar questions or um, this, the advent of the internet and the way in which you know, we kind of have this relationship to image, a shared relationship to image via this kind of hyper mediation is also another way that I think artists in their practices are questioning or asking similar, um, questioning the image and asking similar questions of power in the structure of the image um, in ways that I think move beyond even what we've presented here today and it's um, what you just, spoke of as an example of that. Um, and I wish I could say Do you think more. in the present, the, the sort of, the, pr the presence of the internet also creates the, the illusion of a kind of democratization of the image whereby in theory, you know, everything can be documented and um, it would appear that in theory nothing blocks anything from yeah. being archived. I mean, for sure. I mean, uh, there's a great Jesse Dar Darling, uh, Jesse Darling, the, um, the British artist, a quote about um, that her problem with relational aesthetics was that um, uh, it, it kind of uh, took a, uh, certain segments of society as a, as a kind of um, material uh, in a really, you know, certain, um, you know, individuals as material, uh, and that the post-internet does that the same way, right? That that we are constantly, it's not a d democracy, we're constantly, there's an authoritarian kind of like, the dots are there for a reason, I'm making that decision, right? I'm using bodies in a way that I have to claim ownership of, right? That there's nothing, it's not a democracy, and it would, like, I have as much power in that as, but then it gets recycled in, right? There's that, mm -hmm. that that's where it becomes a kind of an, another part, right? Where the, um, yeah, where, you know, like Seth Price says that its production is, is all an ex excretory phase in, 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 when I, in making. Is that what, it, that's, that quote's wrong. But <laughs> something like that. Well, on that note, maybe, I think I'm being gestured that our time is running out, but I want to, let's thank our speakers for this wonderful Closing thoughts. So the problem is that I'm going to as uh, as our uh, final panel was um, was discussing things, I was sort of shuffling through my notes, trying to pull together uh, some threads of um, you know what what I learned today, as it were, and. Uh,
I'll say I'm left with many more questions than answers. Um, hopefully you are too. If you are researchers and scholars and artists uh, and curators, hopefully um, some of these questions will drive you in your work. Um, I find it interesting. I don't believe that uh, Nisifor Nieps was mentioned today at all. Um, and I don't really blame anyone for that. Um, but he created the earliest surviving photograph from nature, uh, which was actually uh, created in 1826, potentially 1827, um, uh, which is 190 years ago uh, this year. Uh, he described, the discovery I have made and which I call heliography consists in reproducing spontaneously by the action of light with gradations of tints from black to white the images received in the camera obscura, which by that point had been known. Um, we'll say the earliest record is from a, the Chinese philosopher Mozi from uh, 470 to 390 BCE. So for, uh, what is that, 1900 years, the camera obscura reigned supreme, and then this magical little box and process which could fix an image permanently. Um, and so here it is in such a short time, we'll say technology has advanced probably faster than our ethical ability to grapple with the questions that, um, that are raised by the making of these objects. Um, I found it really interesting that uh, Daguerre's print was shown, which displays this prescience of the proliferation of images. Um, and then followed immediately by Henry Fox Talbot's image, which has this implicit, uh, whether intentional or not, uh, some could argue, um, but photo manipulation. And so from the very start of photography as an art, manipulation and censorship came into play. So again, this recurrence of ethics. Um, I also think it's really interesting that um, We'll say in 1965, Sony marketed the Portapack, which was the first portable video camera and recording deck designed for small businesses and industrial uses. But it was very quickly co-opted by activists and artists who saw the potential of video as a means of capturing footage to correct or critique authority by producing and exhibiting more subjective and expressive videos. And so we've heard a lot of talk about um, selectivity and subjectivity. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, um, you know, artists were aiming to create an ephemeral version of art that emphasized process, uh, critique, or experience over pure form, seemingly in defiance of Clement Greenberg's doctrinaire approach to modernism. And yet, um, as we have seen, each artist has really sought a unique style, almost a branding as it were, when it comes to their um, uses of video. Um, artists have embraced various aesthetic strategies from repetition to scale to slow motion, extreme close-up, um, inclusion or exclusion of sound and meditative or metaphoric content um, that speaks from an art-based experiential narrative position. And this has essentially propelled video, um, which was meant to be sort of this, uh, in some ways, anti-purification um, of the medium um, into uh, precisely that, um, a medium, uh, a process, a tool, which defies reference to um, all other media in some ways. So perhaps, and I know Clem bashing is still very popular these days, but perhaps it's fair to give Clement Greenberg credit for having observed this tendency in the human artistic spirit rather than creating um, in this authoritative, you know, father of, quote unquote, father of high modernism, um, as if he was sort of wielding this uh, gigantic power. Um, I also find really interesting, there was discussion of the sense of timelessness versus time. So whether still uh, or moving imagery, these arrays or composites um, we've heard today uh, force a slowdown in the looking. Uh, perhaps that slowdown is merely because there are so many images um, that it forces us 
to grapple with the iconography or iconology of each individual image and how they relate one to another. Um, so of course iconography being the specific symbols and iconology being the, the underlying foundations for um, uh, we'll say an entire body of symbols. Um, one of the most profound questions that I'm still sort of pondering and will be unpacking for a while is what if the images cannot be contained? Um, and I think that uh, was stated in one presentation, but implicit in several others. Uh, there's also this question that I spoke of at the beginning about technology. You know, what is the relationship between empathy and ethics, um, especially given the pace of technological change? Is technology advancing faster than our ethics? Which certainly seems to be true when it comes to technology and the law, and yet the law is responsible for much of the surveillance activity that takes place. Um, and so, uh, of course, when law enforcement agencies and the government are surveying us by various means, um, and then, you know, we have cases like Edward Snowden, um, where all of a sudden this surveillance comes to light and there are all these legal implications, um, really seems to, uh, um, to muddy the waters in a lot of ways. Now, there's also discussion of um, frames and screens as divisions between what is seen and what is less seen or unseen. Um, that which is included is just as important as that which is excluded, or more properly said, that which is excluded is just as important as that which is included. Um, what happened before what was captured? What happened during what was captured but elsewhere, just outside the frame? and what happened after what is depicted. And then I think on a closing note, um, this idea uh, from Philippa Ramos of images of history and images about how images of history enter history, uh, I think is a great closing point for uh, this afternoon. So on that note, uh, I invite those of you who are here um, if you are interested, please accompany us over to the power plant uh, where we will have a reception, um, have a beverage, have a look in the galleries, um, touch base with some of today's speakers. Um, thank you once again for coming to today's symposium.